Okay, well, welcome to today's webinar. So we've been having a little pre-webinar prior to the recorded webinar, but today's webinar is on the art of low-cost real estate marketing part two. Now, let me pop over to the screen share here. There we go right now, good, there we go. So the art of low-cost real estate marketing part two. Now, in part one, I wanna go over what we covered just so you have those takeaways before we start part two here. So in part one, and if you don't have a link to part one, if you don't have that video, uh, just email jenrealestatemavericks.com. We'll send you over not only a video, but we'll send you over the slide deck. But the takeaways, the big takeaways, and by the way, I am hoarse today. As I was mentioning when I was chatting for a few minutes before we started the webinar, um, I've been talking nonstop for the last three days, so I'm kind of losing my voice, but I think we're gonna have it hang on for the next 25 minutes to get through this. So the part one takeaways, one, number one, you need to market a business instead of your name. Um, market a compelling message about your real estate product, your real estate process, not you. I made that mistake. Um, I, I built several businesses uh, where I marketed the business. It had a separate name and I sold those businesses, made a lot of money over the years. But then when I started my luxury home brokerage, I made it Hey Partners. And I told this story last week, I made it about me. And while it made millions and millions and millions of dollars, I made it, I mean, we made a fortune with it every year. The bottom line, it was never a saleable business because it was about me. It was my name. It was about me. And that was a mistake. So don't make that mistake. Market a message. Don't make it about your product, your process, your business. Don't make it about you so that number one, you can scale it. You can bring in other people who can run it, that people aren't expecting you to come out so that they, so that uh, as it grows and as this product and process, whatever it is grows, you can send other people out, you can scale it, you can train them, you can be on vacation, you can make money while you're on vacation and someday you can sell it. So that's number one. Um, and number two, and by the way, I see we have a question here. Let me pop it real quick. Uh, hi, Jen, please email. Okay, all right, that was just somebody wanting a link here, so we're good to go with that, so that's totally good. So, okay, so point two, people don't care what you do, they care what you do for them. And this was, again, uh, for, this was the uh, first webinar. So here, don't talk about what you do, talk about the results you achieve. And I gave several examples of that. So when you're marketing out there to attract business, uh, or you're on uh, listing appointments, but let's talk about attracting business, you wanna talk about the result. Um, for example, uh, I was just talking before the webinar about the buyer rebate program I teach. And so if you were marketing that to sellers, you would be marketing a result. Learn how you can sell your home for top dollar plus $7,500. And then you would talk about, that would be your compelling message. You would market that into a demographic. You would live, die, eat, and sleep that every day. But that would be your message. You would want everybody in that demographic uh, whatever that demographic is, whether it's a demographic of homes, lawyers, or whatever, you would, you would want them to consistently see that message. And remember, that's about your result. Then they would be curious, well, how do you do it? And that's what you explain on the listing appointment. So that was takeaway number two from the last webinar. Takeaway number three, why you should market to unemployed men who just graduated from college who are living with disappointed parents and can't find a girlfriend because they are broke. Well, if you remember my little example there, and I actually did a box of audio on that, you want to direct your message to sliver markets, one market at a time, speaking in a way that makes them know, makes them feel like you know them. Now, my example would be, let's say we take that same compelling message. The compelling message is that learn how I can sell your home for seventy for seventy three hundred dollars above market. That is for top dollar plus seventy three hundred dollars. Let's say that. So that would be based around this buyer rebate strategy I teach, where you're offering, let's say, a 2% buyer rebate for any buyer who buys your listings in a particular community, and that's if they buy direct through you instead of a COBRO. So you're not paying the typical 25 to 3% COBRO fee, but instead you're paying this buyer rebate of 2% if you're in one of the 40 states where you're allowed to do that. So bottom line is, then you could point out to the seller why, you would point out to the seller why, you're able to get buyers to pay more because this attracts more buyers. They're in a higher price frame of mind. They can actually pay more for your home because I'm giving them this rebate out of my pocket. They can pay more for your home and still get the deal they want. So, but the, so that would be kind of the compelling message. But the sliver market aspect would be this. 
you would maybe market in the, into this demographic and you would sliver it even, even further. Let's say you knew that there were a lot of people in the demographic who were retired. Let's say 30, 35% are, are retired. So what you do is you do a campaign into the demographic and you try to target them if you could identify who they are. But it, if you couldn't, you just do it into the whole demographic. It doesn't matter. And you would, but you would talk to retired people. You would say, are you over 60 years old, retired? And you describe this person. You would just describe what we call this customer avatar. So you'd say, are you, you know, over 60 years old? Have you retired? Are you this? Are you comfortable? And you this and that, and whatever. Um, well, do I have a program for you? See, if I'm retired, which I doubt I ever will, but if I were retired and I was over 60 years old, and I won't tell you whether I am or I am not, but if I was over 60 years old and I was retired and you'd kind of describe me and if I'm living in like the Kingsgate community and say, are you retired or 60 years old living in the Kingsgate community? I said, well, boy, that's me. See, I see that. Then I'm more inclined to read that and it says, well, boy, do I have a program for you? I have a way to get you, you know, the person who's over 60, retired, living in this community. I have a program to get you top dollar plus $7,300 talk to me first. Don't listen with anyone else till you talk to me first. Do you see how much more effective that would be? So that was one of the takeaways from last time, and that is do this sliver marketing. And by the way, what this was about is a little boxer I did, why you should market to unemployed men who just graduated from college or living at this point. And parents can't find a girlfriend because they're broke. And I won't tell that story now, but it's a little story that somebody told me in, uh, when I was getting on a plane in Aspen about how if you really, really want to be effective, you will narrow your marketing down that much. I mean, to that kind of person where that person, for those people around the country who fit that profile, whatever it is you're selling, if you said, this is for you, if you're unemployed, graduated from college, you're living with disappointed parents, you can't find a girlfriend because you're broke. Those people who fit that, they would listen to exactly what you said. They would probably, probably buy anything. If you said, I have a new perfume for men. It's a men's perfume and it'll solve all your problems. It'll get you a girlfriend and get you a job. And if it said that in the ad, trust me, they're going to read the ad. And if you gave a return policy, they'd probably buy your perfume. So you see my point. You know, if you market to slivers and speak to people directly, they're going to be a lot more likely to buy. Okay. So the next point uh, takeaway from last week's webinar was to impact fewer people more often. And the bottom line there is frequency enhances believability. Most real estate agents feel like the purpose of frequency is to just get people to remember it, that the more they see your ad, the more likely they are to remember it. <clears throat> and of course, that's true. But I think the bigger, the, the bigger element, the more important thing is that the more often you see an ad, the more you tend to believe it. Because if it's around and it stays around, you tend to think, wow, it must be successful. This product, this process, this service must be working. And consequently, you, don't, you not only remember it, but you tend to believe it. So the idea is to here, you want to market to a smaller demographic, but you want to do it more often. And when I say smaller, you just want to make sure that your budget, whatever it is, allows you, whatever that budget is, don't shoot it out there by hitting gazillion people just hoping you get a response, but you don't have the budget to keep doing it week after week after week. Um, uh, and you're saying, boy, if I don't make a sale, I won't be able to continue. You make sure you've got at least three to four months worth of budget to hit an, a, a demographic at least twice a month. And I recommend three times a month for the first two months and then at least twice a month after that. And don't even expect a response for three months. Now, you'll probably get one, but just don't expect it. Just zero that out of your mind so you're not disappointed. And that's point number four from the last webinar. And then point number five is don't give up when you don't get immediate results. Well, I just covered that. The bottom line is repetition builds believability. Remember, I just said that even with a lousy message. I mean, even if you've got a lousy product and a lousy message, quite frankly, if people see it, they're not going to know it's a lousy product or a lousy process or a lousy home selling, whatever. They're not going to know that till they give you a try and find out it is. Now, hopefully that wouldn't be the case, but you see my point. So bottom line is, you just want to stay with it, and so many agents give up way too soon. Okay, so lastly, and this was last time, <clears throat> once you've developed this message, and last week was all about the message. It was developing the message. That's what this is all about. This week is how to get the message out. I'm going to give you five really super cost-effective ways to get the message out. But 
you want to assess your message, whatever it is, with what I call the ribs test. First of all, is it relevant to your customer? Obviously, sellers want to sell for more. So when you say sell your home for top dollar plus $7,300, that's relevant to a home seller, uh, to a home buyer. Home buyers want to buy for less. So when you market like a buyer rebate and you say buy any home in a certain community and get $6,300, get make your best deal and then get $6,300 cash back in your pocket, obviously that's going to what? Be relevant to a home buyer. Next, um, you know, that's the R. The I is inevitable. You want to make make it sound like what you've got is the future of real estate. It's inevitable. Um, and so a good example of that would be you sell it that way. So you take what I call, and I talk about this later, positions against tradition. So you, if you're promoting, let's say, let's say you're promoting the concept that home owners, home sellers, that you offer your home sellers a reduced commission, let's say 2% commission, if they hold their own homes open, find their own buyers who aren't with real estate agents and send those buyers to you. And one of those buyers buys the home. So you have no Cobra commission then. So you get rid of the two and a half to 3%. And so you're, you know, you might think, well, my typical list side commission would be 3%. I don't know. Typical. I, I, I don't, I don't relate to the word typical. To me, every business should not be about what's typical. It should be just the opposite. It's a, it should be waking up in the morning and thinking to yourself, how can I deliver a better product, a better experience, and do it at a lower cost and make more money by doing it? That's what Amazon wakes up and doing. So I don't even want to go there what's typical, but most people would think a, you know, around a 3% list side commission is typical. So you say to yourself, well, I can easily offer these sellers 2%. I mean, they're going to be doing the work. They're going to find the buyer if they send the buyer to me. And I know some agents would grouse and say, oh, great, gosh, I have to do, <clears throat> you know, when I talk about that kind of a thing, the agents, agents will say to me, but then I have to do all the work. I have to do the buyer side and the seller side. And what in my agency relationship and all this, they make it just so much more complicated than it is. Well, number one, the agency relationship just is whatever. I mean, make it a, Make it so you represent the seller and the buyer is, an unrep is unrepresented. If they want to get somebody, they can. Uh, or that, you know, you do the dual representation if your broker is okay with that and it's legal in your state. There are always ways to handle the buyer and seller. I mean, the bottom line is all you're trying to do, I mean, let's just really get to it, guys. All you're trying to do is help a buyer buy and a seller sell. And, you're, you know, by, to me... I mean, no offense, co-brokes, but to me, I'd rather handle the buyer every day. I mean, get I I honestly have had so many co-broke sales where I would gladly pay the co-broke the 3% just to get out of the way. Just please, if they, of course, they won't do this, but if they would just get out of the way, just let me deal with your buyer. I'll get this deal done. I'll have a happy seller. You'll have a happy buyer. You'll make a commission and so will I. Everybody will be happy. I've done like hundreds, thousands of my own sales, you know, where I represent work with the buyer and I've never had a problem one single time. And you wouldn't even expect me to feel that way because I'm an attorney. I mean, and in the attorney world, you would never represent both the plaintiff and the defendant, but I don't even see the real estate world the same way. It's all just getting a good result. It's a win-win. So what I'm trying to do here, I, I got way off on that. You want to make it sound like your program is inevitable. Like the, like every, why aren't other realtors letting their home sellers show their own home and hold open houses and save money if they find a buyer. And you would just say, doesn't it make sense? Isn't it transparently logical? You don't have to do it, but if you want to do it, it's a way for you to save. So that's the inevitable. Sorry, I got way off on that. I sometimes do that. Um, next, believable. Is it logically and transparently believable? Well, um, I think if you say to a home seller, I offer a, and I'll just use that as an example, um, I offer you the opportunity to hold your own home open. Uh, you have a, a, an opportunity to save. You only pay a 2% commission if you find a buyer who's not working with a real estate agent. And, and then you say the whole idea of it, besides your ability to save money, the possibility you'll save money, the whole idea of it is what? That we're going to attract more buyers working as a team with you holding your home open when I can't be there and me doing all the things I do working as a team, we're probably going to attract more buyers more quickly. We're going to avoid days on the market. Days on the market are death to the price of a home, acid to the price of a home. And consequently, there's no guarantee. We just increase the probability your home will sell more quickly. So people will say, yeah, that sounds believable. So you see, it meets the believability test. So that, that kind of thing is relevant. You make it sound inevitable. You, you point out how it's transparently believable. And you need to make it so simple that a 10-year-old would understand because, well, I won't even say anything more about that. Um, so do one more thing. Does your difference have a credibility enhancing why? I think that is really, really important. 
And let me give you an example of that. Uh, I have this story I tell about Cash Hamburgy. If you don't have, don't know that story, then email Jen, J-E-N-N -N, at realestatemavericks.com and we'll send you over a Voxer. That's a little five minute audio I did on the story. But essentially what, it, what it's about is this. If you offer some special program, then it's important that people see that difference and how it, why it benefits them, okay? But that's not the why I'm talking about. Most people miss that. Most people would know that it's important to have a difference. Most people would know that it's important to have a difference that when the consumer, when the home seller or the home buyer sees it, they see how it benefits them. And that's an important why. But that's not the credibility enhancing why. That's not the big why. I mean, it's an important why. But the really big why, because very few people do it, is consumers need to understand why it works for you. They need to see why it works for you. So when they see that you're different and they see why it works for them, which any smart marketer in real estate is going to make that apparent, but you also want to make sure that they see how you win with this program. So for example, with the example I was just giving you, let's use the seller holding their own home open and you giving them this 2%. You, you explain to them why it works for you. Number one, you don't have a Cobra fee to pay, so you save two and a half, three percent, so you can just lop that right off. They see that, makes sense. And then number two, you say, you're willing to take some of the work off me. If you're willing to hold open houses, et cetera, et cetera, then that takes some of the load off of me. It also increases the probability the home will sell more quickly, which will save me time and save me money, in addition to probably getting you more money for your home, so you, I can afford to give you this 2%. It's a win-win. It's a win-win. Do you see my point? And that was what I pointed out um, about that in the last webinar. You need to have a credibility enhancing why. Okay, so now let's talk about the purpose, the subject of today's webinar, five effective ways to deliver your compelling message. And I'm going to tell you a quick story, but because I'm so hoarse, you're going to have to excuse me while I have a little bit of tea here. Uh, when I... Uh, about 12, 13 years ago, when I opened my luxury home brokerage in Paradise Valley, Arizona, it's a community of about 12,000 people and about 5,500 to 6,000 homes. I had previously been very, very successful in the, we'll call it normal average price range market. And I just decided I wanted to be a luxury agent. I didn't really think it through much more than that. It's just like, okay, it's time, Greg. This is a time in your life. Be an amazing luxury agent. And, and guess what? You'll just probably make two or three times or four times as much money because homes are that much more, that much pricier. And you'll have a lot of fun dealing with a lot of upscale people and you'll get to see a lot of prettier homes. I mean, <laughs> there's the logic, right? Okay. So what is I, what I did, and I'll, you'll see this strategy a little bit later in today's webinar is I went to the Paradise Valley independent newspaper. Turns out there was a newspaper and that'll be my, one of my first things I talk about today that you'll be doing that you should consider doing in your marketing. Is there, is there a publication, something in print that goes to your demographic? Well, it so happens there is a newspaper called the Paradise Valley Independent, and it goes to, it's delivered for free, for free to every resident in Paradise Valley every week. In fact, every Wednesday. So I thought, wow, I mean, this is like built in. This is like my, this is my built in delivery message, right? So I go to the Paradise Valley Independent. And granted, I had a big budget because I was making a lot of money in real estate and, uh, and I'd sold a couple of companies previously and so I had you know, good net worth and a lot of money so I could afford to do this. But you can do this on any scale you want. So I went to the Paradise Valley Independent and I sat down with these guys over there and they didn't know me. I'd never advertised. And I negotiated a deal where I bought several full pages, all right-hand readers, several full-page ads, locked in, signed long-term contracts with them. I also got them to agree to do something they'd never done before, and that is let me have an ad on the front page of the newspaper. So it was very small, it was down at the bottom, but basically it was a sticker, wasn't it, Roseanne? Oh, top right, yeah, the top right, okay, Roseanne's right over here, it's the top right, and this sticker that says, you know, hey partners, and had our compelling message, and uh, you know, just, and they would, they would, and I paid for the stickers, of course, and paid some additional cost. So every Paradise Valley resident, starting like a few weeks later when we launched this, um, saw the, got the paper delivered with, you know, with my company's name, Hey Partners, and our compelling message on it. Uh, check out our private home marketing plan. 
Um, you know, don't home sell your home the normal way. You know, luxury homes need to be sold a different way. You know, is that a cool, compelling message? And then you'd open up, and I had multiple full pages that talked about my plan, my program, how I was different, et cetera. Well, most of the Paradise Valley realtors, they've been around forever, 10, 15, 20 years. They all had their sleepy little half paid ad. They were all doing the same thing, happy with their market share. Well, kaboom, all of a sudden it's like, I own this place. I own the, the paper. Well, the quick story is that this starts off. And, um, and, you know, within a few weeks, I start getting calls and get very busy. People are curious. It's, you know, it's, I mean, it's really fun. And, um, and I had within 24 months, I was a number one, had the number one brokerage in Paradise Valley. I mean, that's how fast that moved along. And in any case, so the fun story is the PV Independent calls me and they say, Greg, this is like just a month into it. And I'm spending a fortune with them, like thousands and thousands and thousands a month. And, uh, and they call me, asked me to come over and I did. And they said, we're wondering if we could ask you a favor. And I said, what's the favor? And they said, would you cut back on your advertising? And I said, would I what? Would I what? And they said, would you cut back on your advertising? And I said, well, why? I mean, why do you want me to do that? And they said, because they were committed by contract. I mean, they, while I was obligated to the advertising, they were obligated to give me the advertising. They just couldn't cut me back. And because I'd signed all these contracts. And they said, well, the truth is a whole group of the top Paradise Valley realtors uh, came over here and visited us together as a group. These were all competitors. There were different firms. And they basically said, uh, we were horrible for letting you do this. They can't believe that we let you buy all these pages and do all this stuff uh, without letting them know and giving them the opportunity. I mean, do you, does that crack you up or what? So they said, they all threatened to pull out, Greg. And while we definitely don't want to lose your business, we can't afford to lose all their business because all together, that's a lot of business. And so I thought about it for a minute and I said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I won't cut back. And they looked really disappointed for a second. And then I said, but what I'll tell you what I will do is I will do this. For any of them that drop out, you just tell them I'll take their space too. And they looked at me and they said, in other words, if they all drop out, you'll buy all that additional space as well. I said, every bit of it, they all pull out, I'll take it all too. And I just thought, whatever. I didn't think they would, but I thought if they do, I'll own Paradise Valley. So. They said, well, fair enough. Okay, we'll give that message back to them. Well, the fun thing is they all picked up their advertising. They didn't, none, not one of them pulled out. They all just increased their advertising. And the Paradise Valley Independent just got a home run out of that. And, uh, and that was 12, 13, 14 years ago. And I'm still one of their best advertisers. I love the people over there. They do a great job. And I know them all personally. And we laugh about a lot of the old stories and things that have happened over the years. But I want to tell you that story because there's a reason. And the first one is to talk about print media advertising. So we're going to, if you print media, everybody's all into online, but I will tell you that when people go in one direction, there is oftentimes quite an opportunity in another direction. And so I want you to be aware of that. And print media is getting hammered. Uh, print media obviously is having a hard time. Uh, attracting people because of all the online alternatives and we'll be talking about that and I'm not necessarily saying you should do print media but I'm not saying you shouldn't do print media I'm saying that you want to match print media to a demographic so if the demographic that you want to go after happens to have a print media publication something print media that impacts that demographic on a frequent and in a cost-effective way you really want to take a good look at that. And quite frankly, if it does and, the, and you can negotiate the right deal, you could just use that. You could own that thing. You could go in and do what I did at the Paradise Valley Independent and own that demographic just through that one print media piece. That's my point. It may exist in the demographic you're after. It may not. Um, here's some examples. One of the agents I coach who's fantastic, Ryan Byrne, um, he runs ads like this in his church bulletin and in the Orange County, in the religious section of the Orange County newspaper. And I just thought this is so well done. Uh, selling your home won't take a miracle. And then he uses my 29 day fifth sale plan uh, that was featured in Forbes, et cetera. So that's an example of something that really is just so powerful for Ryan. Um, marketing to lawyers, obviously you could use a lawyer publication. If your demographic, if you were the realtor for lawyers, forget the using uh, a, a geographic demographic, you could just be the realtor for lawyers. So you would look at lawyer publications that you could get to lawyers in your community uh, cost effectively. My bet is very few realtors would be marketing in those two 
two lawyers, if any, and I'll bet you none would have a compelling message because realtors just don't do that. They just miss the boat there. Um, you could market to a community like an HOA. A lot of times HOAs have publications, etc. cetera. Um, uh, some tips, your ads should appear in the same position. So you want to lock in a position so that people get used to seeing your ad or your ads in the same place in that print media place. They would prefer to be able to float your ad around. You want to negotiate that they can't. Um, ads should have a consistent look. Keep your ads looking the same way. Um, like with Ryan's, Ryan has this really nice color, and while his ads will vary a little bit, um, he always uses this very upscale, upscale bluish color, and you can see his logo there in the right, and you can see his photo, and he uses that look on a consistent basis. You want to do the same thing. So same position, consistent look. Um, look for right-hand readers. Um, Right-hand reader is in a tabloid type type um, newspaper. You want to have your ads appear on the right-hand pages as opposed to the left-hand page. For example, in the Paradise Valley Independent newspaper, if page one is the front cover, which it is, then the first right-hand reader, other than page one, you know, which is just the front of the newspaper, is page three. Page three is usually the most desirable page to have in any tabloid newspaper. If you can get page three, get an ad on page three, that is like primo. I happen to have page three in the Paradise Valley Independent, the entire page three, and I've had it for 12, 13 straight years, um, week after week after week. So right-hand readers. Next best would probably be page five, which follows page three. Um, uh, so that's, that is strategy one for how, how do you get your message out cost effectively? That's print media, ideas in print media. Now, promo cards. This is something I cannot even believe that agents don't do. A promo card is simply your business card. Okay, it's your business card with a compelling message on the back. Now, one of the strategies that I've taught for years, for 25, 30 years, and I built a 4,000 agent real estate firm around, was what's known as the 990 opportunity. <clears throat> I have 990 trademark. And I have thousands of agents across the country that use it. And basically all it is, is that agents will promote out into a community, sell your home with a commission as low as 990, includes all normal traditional real estate services. And all that is, is that you're doing what I was describing earlier in our, where you offer the seller 2%, you offer them 990. Basically you say, if you want to, I, I list your home at my normal commission plan, whatever that is. And if it sells, if I sell it or any other agent sells it, then you pay according to my commission plan, which can be you know whatever percentage and whatever it is. But if you want to hold your own home op home open and you find your own buyers, and you find a buyer who's not working with a realtor, who hasn't seen it with a realtor, doesn't working with a realtor, and they end up being the buyer, I will step in and do everything, negotiate and close the deal, and I'll do it for nine ninety. And so that if that was a, your program, your key program, which is a very good program, by the way, uh, people say, oh, my God, how would you ever do that? Why would you ever sell a home at 990? Well, statistically, about one out of eight of those homes will sell at 990 because most buyers look with real estate agents. So my, most buyers who come through will either have an agent or go back and connect with their agent, in which case your normal commission plan would apply. But once in a while, buyers do come through unrepresented that happen to like that home and they end up buying it. And the bottom line is, so it's a great way to attract a lot of business, a lot of listings, if you're willing to sell one out of eight for $990. Uh, it's like um, Nordstrom having a sale where they are they are totally fine with selling some merchandise at cost or below cost to attract people into the store who buy a lot more of their regular price merchandise. But this isn't about the 990 program. This is just about having a compelling message on the back of your card. And I call them promo cards, but they're really just your business card with a compelling message. It's unbelievable. You're paying for them anyway. So like with my 29-day sale plan, this you could look like this on the back. Sell your home in 29 days, net 3, 5, 8% more. And then you, obviously, there's a whole program I develop. Um, it, it really just, uh, it flies in the face of this idea that other realtors just list homes and throw them right away in MLS and put up a sign right away and how that's ridiculous without any pre-marketing, any, any excitement building, hype building, pre-marketing like Apple does and Tesla does and any smart, any smart company does and that realtors don't do this. So you're taking a position against tradition. You're saying for 29 days, I'm not like pocket listing this thing. I'm marketing it to the real estate community too. We're just not putting it in MLS so we don't start tra tracking days on the market. And so we can also get buyers in a higher price frame of mind because buyers love to see homes 
that aren't officially on the market. So again, this isn't about that program. That's just some of the strategies I teach, but the, that, that attracts a lot of business and sellers love it. They see the transparent, how transparently logical it is uh, that you should that you should build excitement and not throw a home on the market like a loaf of bread. But you would have that on the back of your business card. Um, uh, the uh, the buyer rebate program that I've uh, been teaching for the past few months, which is um, really rocking out there, uh, sell your home for seventy three hundred more than it's worth. Uh, this might appear, and we just made this slide up, but this would appear on the back of your business card and might say below that, talk to me first. So the bottom line is um, you would use my 10 plus 10 promo card plan. Obviously, you're going to give the promo cards. You're going to give your business card to everybody you'd normally give it to. And when they turn it over, they're going to see your compelling message, and there's a good chance they'll ask you about it. And of course, that's the point. But you also, one of the things I teach is that a minimum of five days a week, you will go out and you will put your card in the hands of 10 new people and you will leave 10. That's, that's the first 10. And then you will leave 10 cards laying around so that every single week you are meeting 50 new people that you put your card in the hands of. And you're also leaving 50 cards around and just leaving that 50 cards around. Think about that 50 cards a week, 52 weeks a year. That's over 2,500 cards that you leave laying around, you get business from that. It's unbelievable. You can't believe it, but you'll get a few deals from that. Just having 2,500 cards that you leave if you're shopping for underwear at a department store and you leave your promo card laying on the, laying, laying on the underwear rack you know, with the compelling message up. <laughs> Truly, it's amazing. Like two months later, you may get a card. Somebody says, hey, you know, I can believe this, but I picked up this thing. I happened to be thinking about selling my home and I saw this card that said that you sell homes for 7,300 more than they're worth and it was on the underwear over rack over at Nordstrom. This kind of stuff happens. It takes like no time to do it. So you just spend an hour, hour and a half a day. And I have a whole training program on how you meet those 10 people. This isn't about that. Uh, how you meet those, meet the 10 that you meet people, how you actually do that in a normal and natural way and give, put your promo card in 10 new people's hands every day. Okay, so that's the 10 plus 10 promo card plan. And that is strategy two. You, you just can't not do that. How can you not, whatever your compelling message is, you got to have one. And you got to get it on your on the back of your business card. So the third strategy is online lead pages, and that is simply I don't understand my why more real estate agents don't do this. And all that is is offering home sellers or home buyers something. Uh, it's called an ethical bribe that if they'll give up their email address, let's say that you this is what bold leads and Red X and all these do. Basically, they offer offer an ethic what's known as an ethical bribe in, in this online content world. And all that is is that, hey, you want to find out what your home's worth? Just put in your home address and your email and we'll send it to you. So they get what do they do? They capture the home address, they capture the email and they capture a lead and then they sell those leads to you. Well, why don't you do that? Only do it better. Instead of doing the namby pamby stuff, that the lead generation companies do like, oh gosh, get an appraisal of your home. That is so boring. You know, have a program, have something interesting, like have it be, learn how you can sell your home for $7,300 over market. If you live in the, let's say I'm in, I live in the Scottsdale, Phoenix area. Scottsdale is really just kind of a suburb of Phoenix. So let's say I have something where I'm marketing using targeted Facebook marketing. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And let's say I market into Scottsdale, learn how you can sell your home. A proven method for selling your home for top dollar plus as much as $7,300 over that. Um, go here and download the full explanation of how to do that. Okay, so I just set up a lead pages. There's a company, there's lots of companies. You can go to a company called leadpages.net, leadpages.net. I know the guy who founded the thing years ago. It's, a, it's like 80, 90, 100 bucks a month, and you can set up easily as many lead pages as you want, and, and they just really look like website pages that you can customize out. They have all these templates, and then you can put your download there. So then you would develop, you would develop a download that explained this, it would explain your process, how it is, and why when you're offering rebates, this, this rebate in the Scottsdale area, $7,300 rebate to any buyer who buys your listing in Scottsdale, how this would do what? would cause these buyers to be able to pay up to 7,300 more for your listings and still get the good deal they want. And also would attract more buyers faster because they'd be interested in how you buy this home and get a good deal and still, and still get 7,300 back at closing. So you see my point, you, in addition, you know, this is just like 
you push this out in your newspaper, okay? Remember, match print media to a demographic. You push this out on your promo cards and you push it out on a lead page and you use and you have a download ethical bribe. And then what happens? Um, people download it, you explain it. Then you don't don't promise something and then not really do it. Have the download really explain what it's all about, exactly how it works, and then just have it say on there, hey, give me a call if you'd like to learn more. So that they really see the whole thing as if you were right there presenting it on a listing appointment. And then you put them in a nurture campaign. So let's say people are, you're promoting this, people are downloading it. Um, maybe one out of 10 might call you and the other nine don't, but you put them in a nurture campaign. And I know you know what that is. And that is just an email campaign you have set up. And you might set this up in something like Infusionsoft. Uh, Infusionsoft is really good at this kind of thing, although you can do it in other email clients. And it just, whenever somebody downloads your ethical bribe, it just automatically puts them in a sequence that they get your first email like in a week. And maybe that is, hey, I noticed you downloaded this thing. I know you downloaded my thing a week ago. And I just wanted to let you know that it works that a little more about it. And then you describe that in the thing. And then maybe a couple of weeks later, they get another one that, oh, by the way, something I forgot to mention to you before in my previous email was this. And you just keep and build that relationship with them, giving them good stuff. You do not make this nurture campaign emails about, please listen to me, don't forget me. Please listen to me, don't forget me. No, you make it good content. You make it interesting. You make it, you impress them with how smart you are. Maybe you just share cool, interesting articles. Like I saw one the other day, I think it was on Inman about um, the uh, the homes that NFL players use. The five, and it had like five photos of amazing NFL players' homes of all description. I mean, Tony Roman, you know, some of the different players, the quarterbacks, et cetera, that you would know. And it was just really interesting. And so you might share a link to that. You might just, you know, put your email out, and share a link to that where people could go over. So you might be interested in this. The idea is they start seeing you as a thought leader and as an expert. Okay, so that's that. Now, strategy four, naturally, goes is what I call thought leadership. And that is where you take tr positions against tradition. I talk about this all the time in my coaching and training. I cannot understand why p agents don't do this more because the real estate business is so traditional. So many people do so much the same thing all the time. And there's such opportunity to look at all these things that are being done that could be done so much better and take these positions. And the idea is that you you would post blogs on LinkedIn and you can post the same thing on your website without getting penalized. I don't know if you know this by Google. Normally you can't, you shouldn't post the same content in multiple places online, but because LinkedIn is looked at separately, you can have a blog on your website and run it also on LinkedIn. So push it out on LinkedIn and also push it out on your website and without being penalized. So, and this is a thought leadership where you're not just sharing stuff you're not just sharing stuff that people um, may not know. That's good. Do some of that. Share stuff that people don't share what people already know. I see so much stuff out there. Just don't. Don't share what you know people already know. That's stupid. Um, share things that either people don't know that they'd be interested in, like the homes that NFL players live in, or share positions, take positions and talk about how the home selling process, maybe you take a position that it's ridiculous, that other agents are just throwing homes on the market like a loaf of bread. That the first thing they do is throw it in MLS and throw up a sign. Why don't they build anticipation, build excitement among buyers, among the real estate community, and let people have private showings and do all this kind of thing for some period of days? I mean, just doesn't it make sense? Take a position. Not everybody will agree with you, but so what? That's not the point. They'll start seeing you as a thought leader. Thought leaders lead thought. Thought leaders don't just share a bunch of junky information. They lead thought. I don't think people get that. They just share a bunch of junk. Um, so you then turn those blogs into print articles. So you, there's another way to use your blogs. You turn your blogs into videos. So whatever you write in a blog, look at how you do this. So you then you can do a little shoot a video and push it out on YouTube. Um, you then take the audio out of that and make it a podcast. And like you could go to Greg Haig uh, on iTunes, Greg Haig's podcast. And I have 52 or 53 podcasts up there, actually not about real estate. Uh, but they're, they're instead about real estate, they're about uh, the best business books ever written. And I did three quick audios on the best business books uh, on each of the, what I consider some of the best business books ever written. So that's my podcast because I think that was just kind of cool. The best takeaways out of those books that you can get in a two minute audio. So you can do that. Uh, you can turn what you're writing into a 
what you do in a video into a podcast. And then you can also take little extracts, like, you know, little sentences, your best sentences out and turn them into tweets. And it's what um, a friend of mine, Brendan Burchard, this was not something that I came up with, uh, this term, he calls it circular virality, circular virality. And that is when you produce something, finding ways to use it, well, being able to use it in multiple ways. That makes sense? And so strategy number five, and I'll be real simple with this. I'm not going to teach you targeted Facebook marketing. I've, I've learned it pretty well, but I'm not expert enough to be able, that, that I would want to be a teacher in it at this point. But I'm going to tell you, your future could depend on learning targeted Facebook marketing. Um, there are some very good companies that do targeted Facebook marketing. And uh, if you're interested in the one that we work with and that we recommend, email Jen, J-E-N-N, at realestatemavericks.com, and we'll be glad to pass along that recommendation. Um, I think they do a phenomenal job. There are a number of companies that do it, but I think you need to learn it too. You can do this on your own. And I know I am committed to learn. I'm still going to use this company, but I want to learn it because it will help me guide this company better. And also, I want to do some of it on my own. And you just got to subscribe to a Facebook marketing course. Uh, you want to, if you, if you ignore every other form of social media, but you learn TFM, targeted Facebook marketing, you'll be doing yourself a favor. I promise you. This is so powerful. And Facebook Live, Facebook Live is something that you talk about thought leadership. You talk about draw, drawing people to your lead pages so they'll download your ethical bribes. I mean, um, Facebook is really pushing out Facebook Live. It's not hard to do. If people get all weird about it, oh my gosh, what if I mess up, et cetera. Nobody cares. I mean, I, I don't think like get all nutsy on these webinars. This is just me. I mean, I'm here at home. Uh, you know, quite frankly, I have this shirt on and I have a pair of shorts on, uh, you know, in tennis shoes. I mean, that's just me, whatever. You know, the bottom line is people are interested in what's in your head. And if you don't say it exactly right, that's not the point. The point is that through targeted Facebook marketing and Facebook Live, you can get your message out, in my view, more cost effectively than any other way online. So um, one course that I subscribed, I took is James Wedmore's Facebook marketing course. He's young. I think he's kind of cutting edge. There are a ton of good ones out there. Uh, I don't even know James personally. Um, I've never called him or met him. Uh, he was just recommended to me. There are a ton of good ones, but his, his, I think, I think I paid 250, 300 bucks. I think it was three payments of $97, not even expensive. So it's just something you might check out. And by the way, if you do let him know, Greg Haig sent you over. He won't even know who I am, but just say Greg Haig sent me over and maybe he'll give me a call and, uh, and I'll get to know him and he'll give me a little one hour private lesson or something. So we're going to finish up uh, with this. What can you learn from a 23-year-old who turned down $3 billion? Well, um, I'd like you to hear the audio I did last night. It's just five minutes, and it's on the uh, – if you email Jen, she'll send you over a link to the audio, Jen at Real Estate Mavericks, and it's about um, Evan Spiegel, the founder of Snapchat, who turned down $3 billion um, offered by Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook. And um, it's, a, it's a fun little bit uh, audio. It's only five minutes. You might want to listen to it. I do a little parody like I, I – produced a little uh, satirical email that um, Spiegel might have sent to Zuckerberg. He really didn't, but I think you'll find it kind of fun. So if you email Jen, she'll send that over. In any case, the point is, though, of that, it's about the four C's. Why did he turn down $3 billion? And here's why. He turned it down because of what um, – I didn't make this up. This, was, this is something that's taught by Dan Sullivan. Uh, Dan Sullivan is one of the best – I would consider one of the best business coaches in the country – he has a company called Strategic Coach. Um, it's relatively pricey, twelve to fifteen thousand bucks a year, or I think it's twenty five thousand bucks if you you know do it directly from him. Um, but you know I get involved in a lot of these networks and things, and I just don't think you can learn enough. Um, my partner and friend Harvey McKay often says the biggest room in the world is the room for improvement. Well, the bottom line is Dan teaches this, and I thought it was just so spot on, and so the reason that Evans that Spiegel didn't sell to Facebook. And that is commitment builds courage, which builds confidence, which builds capability. And I use the example I often use is this. Um, if you have a child and your child falls in the water, you're out in the boat. And even if you don't know how to swim, you're immediately, you're immediately going to jump into the water to save your child. Your commitment is so high to save your child that your courage, you don't even need, I mean, your courage is just overwhelmed by your commitment. Well, what happens is you're going to save your child. 
you are going to save your child. That's going to happen. So you're going to pull your child out of the water, even though you don't know how to swim. That's going to build your confidence. And all the, by the way, you're going to learn a little bit about how to swim and doing it. And maybe it'll cause you to take a swimming lesson. My point is in business, I believe that the reason, one of the big reasons that I know why Spiegel turned down uh, Zuckerberg, and that is because he has so much commitment to building Snapchat, that Snapchat is going to be so much bigger than $3 billion. Now he could be wrong. What if he's missing his bet? What if Snapchat is just a memory in two or three years? You know, uh, old websites like what, Friendster and that kind of stuff. I mean, they totally went away. Um, but, and so you think, how, how do you not take $3 billion? Well, you, the way you not take $3 billion is your commitment, your belief in what you're doing is so deep, is so great that you, you have the courage to turn down the money. You have the confidence to know that you're going to take this and make it bigger and make it even better. And that's going to give you that kind of commitment is going to give you the capability to do that. And I, uh, I found this little meme last night. I actually put it out with my audio. And if you can't read it because it's small on the screen here, uh, it's on commitment. And it says the chicken is involved, but the pig is committed. <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good illustration of commitment in the four C's. So, Last, I'll finish the webinar, and I hope I didn't run too much over today. I don't have a clock in front of me. Um, do you wake up as excited as you did your first day in real estate? Well, if not, go ahead and email Jan at Real Estate Mavericks, and all I want you to do is in the subject line, put the word board. You don't have to say anything else. Just make it full caps, put board, nothing in the, nothing in the email at all, and you're going, to get, uh, you're going to receive a private invite to my Get Excited About Real Estate webinar next Wednesday. This is going to be like a webinar I've never done before. What I'm gonna do, and it will run long, it won't be 30 minutes, it'll probably run closer to an hour. I am going to rapid fire, like I've never done before, the best, the best stuff I know in real estate. I'm gonna go through so much content so fast in a amazing rapid fire, I'm so excited about this, in a rapid fire slideshow, and I am gonna go through strategy after strategy after strategy after strategy, and I gotta tell you, if after you listen to that webinar, after you listen to that webinar, and we'll be glad to send you the slide deck, if you don't get some ideas out of that that get you up excited the next day, get out of real estate. <laughs> You have no hope. You're never going to be excited about real estate because I'm going to pour it all. I'm going to pour it all into somewhere between 30 and 60 minutes. So that's what that'll be about. Email Jen at Real Estate Mavericks and put the word board in the subject line and we'll take care of you from there. So, and if you'd like slide decks, uh, if you'd like any of the links to slide decks, my previous webinar, including last week's email Jen. And if you'd like a copy of my coaching brochure, go to Real Estate Mavericks and download my 17-page coaching brochure. I'll tell you, I'm going to change that up. Go ahead and download it. Everybody who does, I'm going to produce a new one. I've decided in my coaching brochure, and I'll finish with this, instead of having all this stuff about me, I talk about how I got started and how I fell on my face when I was new in real estate and and then, you know, recovered and came back. And uh, I have a copy of the Wall Street Journal article in there back in 1980 uh, about how I had fallen on my face in real estate, built this firm, and then, you know, went out of business. And, and you know, and then I talk about a little about my life since then and some of the strategies I've used and a lot of testimonials in there. I'm going to change that. So if you haven't done, downloaded that, do so that you get on the list because I'm going to produce a new 17-page coaching brochure. And this one's going to be filled with the kind of stuff I talk about in next week's webinar. I just decided that I'd love to have you guys all uh, get my coaching and pay me to do that. But, you know, I just, just going to finish with this. I just want to, I want to make a big impact out there. I really want to see if I can help you, those of you that are listening today, uh, hopefully you're in my coaching. You get lots of extra TLC and a lot of personal stuff if you are. But I really want everyone out there to understand how much better real estate can be and how it's not that hard to be successful, but you just have to do things different and how to do those things different. So I'm going to even produce a coaching brochure that has a lot of what I do in next week's webinar in it. So in any case, if you'd like my coaching brochure, go over and download it and I'll finish up by saying you guys are amazing. Whoop, there it is. So I'm going to go off of the screen share. You guys are amazing. Thanks for tuning in today. How long did I run? Yeah, you know, I am so sorry. Gosh, look at me. Ran, um, you're in like 20, 25 minutes over. Hope you enjoyed the content. If you did, send us a note and say you did. We really appreciate that. Also, for those of you, yep, everybody's still hanging on. Um, if you really like what I'm doing, if you appreciate this webinar, I'd love a LinkedIn recommendation. If we're not connected on LinkedIn, um, 
invite me and we'll connect. If you are connected with me on LinkedIn, two sentences, just go in my real estate Mavericks profile on LinkedIn and just say, Greg, you rock or Greg, you stink or whatever you want to say. But I sure appreciate the LinkedIn recommendation. I am the most recommended real estate trainer and coach on LinkedIn. And I'd like to keep that title and you could help me out. So I appreciate that. In any case, thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Have an amazing day. And I will see you next Wednesday on how to get excited, how to get excited about real estate again. Bye-bye.